On Beauty by Claire Malcolm. No, we could not itemize the list of sins they can't forgive us. The beautiful don't lack the wound. It is always beginning to snow. Of sins they can't forgive us. Speech is beautifully useless. It is always beginning to snow. The beautiful know this. Speech is beautifully useless. They are the damned. The beautiful know this. They stand around, unnatural as statuary. They are the damned. And so their sadness is perfect. Delicate as an egg placed in your palm. Hard, it is decorated with their face. And so their sadness is perfect. The beautiful don't lack the wound. Hard, it is decorated with their face. No, we could not itemize the list. <gasps> What the hell? Oh my gosh. Maddie, do you see what I'm seeing right now? Is there another person in this room? Do in this rec room? Do we have a guest on this episode? Whoa! Welcome to The Rec Room with Mandy and Mio, a podcast about books and the people who write them. Welcome, everyone. This is a podcast called The Rec Room with Mandy and Mio, where we ask the question, when does a writer's work become required reading? In each episode, we take popular authors of the day and review each entry in their bibliographies to see just how close these writers get to the sweet spot between mainstream breakout success and traditional literary sensibility. My name is Mio. I'm Mandy. And we have a special guest in The Rec Room today. Hello. Live. Oh crap. Okay, I'm gonna not live. I mean, not... well, like live, not like live, like in person. Yeah, but live <laughs> we have to think of like a we have to think of like an alternative to in the flesh for these times, like in the in, in the virtual in the in stream the <laughs> in the sh- in the call <laughs> in the pixel. That's right. I'll, I'll the be pixel. like, oh, well, yeah. well, That's well, Jampa Squall in the call. In the- <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So to introduce our guest, wow! Let me just say he is one of the co-hosts of the Giz Up and Top of the Flops. His music writing appears on the Rest Is Noise PH dot com, and he is currently working on a new book of poems. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Jam Pasquale. Yeah. What's up, y'all? Thank you for having me. I am stoked to be here, as you know. Jam, we're so excited, but and also I great. like we're so nervous because like we want to make sure like everything is gonna be great. Um, mm-hmm. and we oh, dude, it's okay, it's okay. We definitely cool. like when we were thinking about doing this mini series, like we definitely we're doing a mini series. By the way, on if you don't know already, we're doing a mini series <laughs> on the books <laughs> of Zadie Smith. In case this is your in first case time, this is your here. first episode, and you're very confused about. <laughs> About what's going on? Uh, I'm normally is, not here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah he's not. This he's is new. This is new to everyone. If this yeah. is your first time here, this is completely new to us all. But we're doing a mini series on the fiction of Zadie Smith, and one of the reasons that we decided that Mandy and I decided that this would be a good mini series to cover is so that we, although we're not particularly familiar with her work, at least coming into this mini series, we knew a lot of people who had enjoyed and read and talked about how much they love her work. And so we immediately thought, okay, this is going to be a good opportunity to get people in on the podcast. And we naturally thought of you. And we were thinking about where we could slot you in. Uh, This felt like the best one to put you in for several reasons. Mm -hmm, Uh, mm -hmm. One of which is not, it's not just the poetry, but I think like um, you have like your work now is like, as we were saying earlier, you do a lot of music writing now where you do a bit of criticism and reviews on new albums you also have we didn't really mention but you're um you have an instagram that's all about reviewing the uh, albums that you're listening to and criticism Mm -hmm. is like implicitly a big part of this novel as well looking at aesthetics and the principles of beauty because this book uh, i don't think i've also mentioned it either i'm very rusty is on beauty (laughs) on beauty which is um zadie smith's third novel my favorite of her books granted i haven't um I haven't read like all of her books. Like the first one I read was White Teeth. That was a great right. episode yeah. you did on that, you guys. Um, oh, and you. then I read On Beauty. Um, and it's funny because I read On Beauty 
as a um was I a college freshman or sophomore, I was just a starry eyed collegiate, not very different from the subject position of many of the characters mm-hmm. uh in the book. And I mean you guys know this already. Like my first tattoo uh is from On Beauty. Oh no kidding. Oh wait, I, actually I had no idea. I didn't know that at either. all. Yeah. Which oh one yeah, is dude, this? like it's the one on my left wrist, the 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 flower looking oh. thing. I did not know oh. this. Does your ebook wow. have the flower looking thing? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. Yes, it does. It does. It does. Oh my yeah. gosh! Oh my gosh! That's why it looks so this, is that weird. Like I was staring at it and I was like, "Do I know what this is?" <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> so I think clearly okay. we picked the right person. To <laughs> yeah, do this. this was crazy. I, okay. Yeah. Well, he literally. This book literally had its mark on Jam. <laughs> yeah. <it's, laughs> Fun fact: the uh, the proper name for that typographical device is a Dinkus. <laughs> so I got a. <laughs> you got you yourself, got a yourself a dinkus on your wrist, yeah. buddy. Yeah, I got a you dinkus got on my wrist. That's right. That's oh, right. Oh man, the dinkus. Only we could all have dinkus. The real dinkus was wrists. in front of us all along. All along, that's true. It literally was. <laughs> it was. It was. <laughs> okay. Um. Well, yeah. So that's perfect. Um, on beauty as a book. Um. It. It's this, as I mentioned. It's the third novel that Zadie Smith wrote. Um, and one of the crucial pieces of context to mention as we're talking about sort of how this book came about is that um, after Zadie Smith um, published her second novel, The Autograph Man, she came to the United States and she became a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. And the reason that this is sort of um, important is that it's believed that the setting of On Beauty, Wellington College, uh, is an inspira- is the inspiration is inspired sorry rather by Harvard um mm-hmm. by the her, the time that she spent there and it's believed that um she makes a cameo during the faculty meeting do you do you remember there's that one scene oh, I remember this, yes. where a writer really? like a fellow a person leaves the faculty meeting like one person and it's described that person's described like as a feckless novelist and it's supposedly her Oh, that's her self-insert? <laughs> yeah. that's so- oh, okay. Yeah. That's so funny. So it's a funny thing from her. But um, yeah, so while she was at Harvard, she was sort of like reflecting upon what it was like for her when she was a student before in the UK. And she sort of felt like a student yet again, uh, being in this academic environment. And that's sort of where the seed was planted for her to write a novel that was about universities and academic culture. Right. Uh, the other big pieces of context for this novel... Um, she's like largely inspired by the novel the Howard's End by E.M. Forster. Uh, and in fact, like this is a thing that surprised me because I have not, I don't know about you guys, I've not read any E.M. Forster no, uh, before this at all. But me neither. When I, when I, uh, I watched the film, the Merchant Ivory adaptation mm-hmm. from the 90s, and I realized that a lot of the plot details and structure for, the, um, for uh, On Beauty comes from Howard's End. So the way Howard's End opens is that there are also two families and then two uh, like two of the children from the two families are engaged to be married. So they send somebody over, the aunt, and then on the way to the house, they the, yeah, they break up. And so <laughs> she doesn't know. And then she inadvertently reveals like, oh, yeah. they're supposed to be married. And like, no, they're not. And, yeah. you know, that's one of the many things that um, Smith borrows from Forster. And the thing is, like, if you look at the context, sorry, did she basically write Forrester fanfic? Sort of. I, is this an AU? The thing is, so she. This is says a genuine question. I'm asking. in her acknowledgments. This is an homage to oh, okay. Howard's End, but I I feel like it's actually more of an update because if you right. go yeah, back like to Howard's End, like a lot of um what Forrester is trying to examine there are like class differences, mm-hmm. and like. He, here she's like clearly plugging in more than just like class. Like stuff. there's also race. There's also thing yeah. about gender differences, mm-hmm. and like, and especially and like diaspora stuff. Yeah, like and also. and especially like in Howard's End, like there there is an aspect of the husband character kind of getting away with it, which doesn't right. that happen which... at all here in On Beauty. Yeah. Is like. Yeah, that's, absolutely. Mm, there's that beautiful image at the end of On Beauty where all the three kids are just giving the finger to their dad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> which is good. Um, there's another crucial piece of context, which is the source of the title. But I think we can talk about um, On Beauty and being just by Elaine Scarry um, when we get 
later on into discussing the book, discussing the plot of the novel. Okay, in broad summary, uh, On Beauty is about two families. It's about the Kipps family and the Belsey family. And the Kipps are, like, very conservative, while the Belseys are very liberal. Yeah, very secular, very liberal. Yeah. And, like, atheists. You, you've got this immediate mm. contrast of, like, Howard and Howard Belsey and Monty Kipps, who are both academic experts on Rembrandt. Um, they're both are they're both art history profs. They're right? both art history profs, and like Monty is like very well published, while mm-hmm. Howard is like really struggling to get yeah. his great magnum opus out into publication, mm-hmm. yeah. but he can't just seem to do it. Um, yeah, that's one of the things we learn about him at the start. Um, yeah. But you know, the the interesting thing about I think this novel is that even though it sets that up at the start of the novel, you realize that the book is not really all about that contrast. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Like, like I, I don't know about you guys, but like I was like clocking to find out when Monty would have his own, like, I thought it was going to be like in, in White Teeth where they would jump from perspective to perspective or from family to family. And instead what ends up happening is that Monty, I think, doesn't even show up until part three. Like, in proper. Like, he doesn't yes, have his own yes. full scene until part three. Yeah. Uh, and the book mostly orbits around Howard. Yeah, and, and the yeah. Belzies that you see, like, what their family's like, how their family dynamics work, and how things are more or less, like, uh, I guess, like, intellectually dictated by Howard. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, like, it's yeah. to the point that the first glimpse that we get of, like, the Howard family, uh, the Belzy family dynamics is... In the opening chapter, you have the emails between Howard and his son Jerome, Jerome. who is in, Jerome the eldest, yeah. who is in love with uh, Victoria, Victoria. Kipps, the daughter of uh, Monty Kipps. Right, and you see that um, Jerome is like clearly writing those emails, like he's trying to get on Howard's nerves, like saying, mm-hmm. "Like, oh, you know, the Mo- the Kippses are really like they're a good family. Like, I actually went with them to yeah. church." Yeah, and then he like, even says stuff like, I don't know what your deal is. Yeah. Like, yeah. He's yeah. literally trying to piss off his dad. And he's Which like, I know you're not replying, but I know you're reading. And yeah, true. It does establish that. Yeah, and, and it's great. Um, and, and which is, again, funny because when you go through the rest of the book, Jerome actually figures very little into the rest of the novel. Yeah. <laughs> that, he, crazy. So so it was, like a, it was a funny surprise to me for me to be like, oh, okay, this... This novel does not end up where I thought it would See, go based yeah. on how it opened. Um, and I think, again, part of that like is largely comes from her trying to follow Forster uh, in mm-hmm. this novel. Uh, but anyway, like what happens is that you have this sort of quick incident where Howard goes to London to find out what's going on. He doesn't realize that Jerome and Victoria have broken up. Uh, and he ends up sort of spilling the beans to the rest of the family, which causes a little tiff. And then Jerome and Howard go back to the States. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Howard is like from London, right? He's Howard's, English, yeah, yeah. Howard's English. And there's, I remember and there's white. like a scene later on where he Wait, sees where his they, dad. He visits yeah, his dad. Yeah, he goes to the yeah, dad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is again where I'm um, like... Where like Zadie Smith's like um, penchant for like um, crisscrossing cultures comes in because um, mm-hmm. yes, Howard absolutely. is English, but um, he's based in the states. Uh, yeah. So uh, it, the, the fictional university town of Wellington is um, set like somewhere outside of Boston, so there's already that right. tension going on there. And also, mm-hmm. Kiki Belsey um, is African American, I believe. Yeah. So, uh, so Kiki Howard's wife is from Florida. Mm-hmm. She's like born and raised, and so like they seem like I, th- I I I it struck me right away that when you first meet them, or at least when you first see them together, they're very much at odds. Like Howard's very intellectual, while um, Kiki is very much like rooted in sort of non academic pursuits. Like she works. In yeah, a she's hospital. a very salt of the earth kind of person. Yeah, yeah, she's very Whereas, like Howard like can't go five minutes without making a quip. Right. Yeah. And and it's sort of the thing where like when you realize that the novel is more about the conflict between them than it is between Howard and Monty, and Monty. or the Belsies yeah. and the Kips, like yeah. you you find yourself like increasingly grated by Howard's academic attitude. 
Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, because he can't put it aside of himself right. to deal with shit. Like, in this is really skipping ahead, but in when they eventually have that one argument, and she says all these valid things about her like gripes with him. You don't and, believe in anything. That's what she says. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. When she says, and then and then when and then also when she says the stuff like, um, I I. I staked my life for you. He does not understand what that means at all. Yeah. Because yeah. in his mind, like in his super academic mind, he's like, well, like that doesn't make sense because we have yeah, what does that mean? together. Yeah. What does that even where, mean? Where's then, the like, theoretical framework for this? Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. He's like, whose outline am I reading right now? Yeah. <laughs> whose thesis is this going to be? <laughs> and then he calls her hysterical, even though she's like not even yeah, or or like she, he even says like this conversation's below you, and I was like, yes, Fuck he's, you, dude. he says it's beneath you and beneath me. Yeah, and I was like, girl, fuck <laughs> like, you, like, dude. At one point in the book, like, uh, I, I'm not the kind of person who writes in my books. Uh, uh, I, I really should though. At one point, I I just like highlighted a part. Uh, a thing that Howard said and I was just like fuck you dude like, yeah. I, I, I <laughs> like your note you, you encircled it and you were like fuck this <laughs> I, I, I couldn't help it I say I, I had to this put it in the margin like, fuck you a... man yeah yeah <laughs> yeah he does literally this whole book is liter- is just like if this could have a subtitle like if it could be on beauty Colin something it would be on beauty Colin sh- Howard shut the fuck up challenge <laughs> 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 literally <laughs> Every other thing he says and or does, yeah, it's it's really one of those things where it's like, dude, why are you confused as to why you have problems? Right, exactly. You know, because like, and and, it, and it's very do. much that thing where like his academic career kind of mirrors his marital relationship, where yes, he can't bring the Rembrandt book to a completion, mm-hmm. in and he keeps like asking for more time. To keep yeah. finishing it, and in the same way that he keeps asking for more time for himself to improve, which is like, and he's not really putting any effort. But in he's it. not doing it for either yeah, of those yeah. things. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But yeah, you see how this also seeps into the personalities and their relationships with their children. Like after you have mm-hmm. that email chapter, you have a chapter where it shows the most of the family in the kitchen table where they're not even talking. It's sort of like a silent dance of utensils and plates. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But like Can you break it down for us like the unique right, pathologies right. quote so, unquote of each of the kids. So we know about Jerome. So there's that whole thing where he's like very much at odds with his dad. And like even though it's not really like given much detail in the novel, there's this implication that he goes through this sort of discovery of faith through the novel that he becomes yeah, Christian. He's born again. Yeah, he yeah. ends up going to church. Uh, he just wants to believe in love, yeah, man. That was yeah. like part of the thing yeah. in yeah. his emails. He's very like, romantic. Love. That's what it is. He's very yeah. much a romantic in every sense. Like not just like in terms of, you know, his relationship with Victor with V, but like even I guess with Christianity, because the way that he describes it as early as the emails, like he knows it's something that his dad will never understand right. also. And he I guess he romanticizes that, that within himself. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. For himself, yeah. Absolutely. Then you have Zora, the middle child. She and she's like sort of on the same level as her father. As her dad. But yeah. I, I like how the novel gives that a nuance by making her question that midway through. Like, do I really yeah. believe in anything? Like she's us yeah, and yeah. everyone in college. She's just basically yes. like I was gonna say she's yeah, she's literally every liberal arts. Student. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Guys, 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 I had a realization while no, I was like no. reading this book. Um, um, for those of you listening, if you've seen Community, this book is like, yes. it's mostly Brita's. <laughs> yes, I was about to say, do you think Zora is like Brita if she was a bit better? It's a, it's a bunch of Brita's and Jeff's um, <laughs> yes. in this book right here. Um, to put Absolutely it more specifically, so. Zora is the kind of person who like everything in life, she has to put it um, through like uh, a scholastic rigorousness. You know, she's yeah. like on top of her grades. Um, mm. She's like... Most comparative lit majors I've met who are like, well, you're wrong because A, B, and C. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like, she's also going through this, like, um, she has like this self actualization thing going on where she, like, she's just trying to get to the top of the food chain of the university. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, in that yeah. sense, she kind of takes, she takes after her father um, mm-hmm. quite a lot in that regard. Yeah. And, and the novel sort of sets out to show how she doesn't end up falling into that trap, hopefully. Or, like, the things that happen in her life that stop her from falling into that trap. 
I, I will say, Zora is actually, I think so far, my favorite Zadie Smith character. Mm. I really oh, love reading like, her chapters. Okay. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like the part where she's, yeah, like that part I mentioned where she's in the car outside the bus stop and then she's like thinking, like, is this just stuff people tell tell me, or do I really yeah, believe in or what do I believe it? I'm learning in college, and I'm like, yeah, Zora, keeping it real. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> also, Zora, you deserve this. Yeah. Like, keep going. Super, super. Your brother's never gonna feel yeah, this. Yeah. <laughs> so you have those two, and then the third, the youngest child is Levi, who mm, he's in high school, right? I'm not. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He's, so he's high school going into college. He's high school going yeah. into college, and it's sort of like assumed, like, yeah, he's gonna end up going to probably he'll go to Wellington as Wellington. well. But he, he he's not really into it. Sometimes he seems to be skipping school, and he also seems to put more time into his like uh, part time job. job at a mega store. Mm-hmm. Uh, and his like he goes through a radically different path mm-hmm. where he starts yes. to develop his like political consciousness, his social consciousness. Not at all through the school, but by actually going out into the world and meeting people. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And even though he doesn't really get into get himself into odds with his dad, but you you sort of see how he kind of develops. He resents. Yeah, he sort of resents of his dad. Yeah, and he kind of develops the more I guess like outside of academia like mindset towards what Howard seems to believe in. Right. Yeah, this is presented like right from the get go, from the way he speaks. He speaks, right? yes. yeah, Where, yeah. Whereas, like, and Howard also how is, he like, dresses. Howard uh, takes on a very uh, academic language register. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, and Jerome's very like, English. He's very polished. What's up, man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yo, yeah yo, and yo. He, he, the one, the word that he says a lot is like, "Hey, you know." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> Zadie yeah. spells that's one word. Hey, you know, ask mom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nah, nah. That's a uh, I know. I, I know, I but know, I, yeah, 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 sorry. I don't um, know. Yeah. As well. So, so uh, but he's very colloquial. Yeah. With the way he presents yes. himself. And yes. it's it's one of those things where I recognize it as something that Zadie Smith was bringing back from White Teeth, where she had mm-hmm. a young character going through adolescence and then aspiring towards, or like sort of like trying to make sense of, at least his, in in particular to these characters, his blackness, yeah. and that's sort of what endears him later to a character that we'll talk about when. When he comes in, um, yeah. But but he's sort of trying to make sense of his identity, his racial identity, and where he belongs in the world, and his class identity, and his class also. identity. Yeah, yeah. So that that's you have there the picture of of the family. Um, mm-hmm. Let's not forget about Kiki though. Oh yeah, Kiki. Well, oh, yeah. yeah, we were saying Mama that Kiki, Kiki uh, herself is very practical. She, as you were saying, she works in a hospital. Um, she's the type who. Um, She's very like invested in in political things. Like there's that scene later on when she finds out that Levi is attending protests. She's like, "Oh, good for you, good for yeah. you." <laughs> but then like, good for you. But she's also not like like that. Also ends up sort of getting turned on its head later on when Levi becomes more and more radical about what he's willing to do mm. to show that he believes what he believes in. Yeah. Um, and and I think that that's also a very interesting nuance in itself. Um, what we learn also about Kiki is that she's a character who, uh, as you mentioned earlier, now she she has staked her life in her yep. in the terms that she for her marriage, yeah, for her marriage, not really for herself. And when she's mm-hmm. talking later to Monty Kipp's wife Carleen, mm-hmm. uh, she talks about how she had sort of plans for herself, like she had a vision of yeah. the way her life was gonna go. And she kind of just like was like, no, I'll make a compromise. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is like, yeah, and that's sort of where you know, like, okay, this this novel definitely has to end with her getting her way. Yeah, like for once, Absolutely. like she got it. She's got to do it for herself. Absolutely. Yeah, for once. and the book makes it very clear to us that like, um, out of everybody, well, not out of everybody, but like certainly more than Howard, she's the one who does like the most heavy lifting and emotional labor. Yeah, in terms mm-hmm. of like keeping Absolutely. the family yeah. together. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, I guess in that way, Howard is a very stereotypical English person, and she's a very stereotypical American in that way that part her American sensibilities are so straight to the point. And, mm. like, very forth, like, very, she's very upfront about everything, and she wants everything to be clear to her. Yeah. Whereas Howard, yeah. you know, like, and you know how there are always those memes that like English people always repress everything <laughs> and they keep it inside until they die and um, I that, and then I guess 
on top of that is Howard's like as we talked about already his academic mind so parang he's so compart- compartmentalized yeah in totally so yeah. many ways yeah. so it really like regresses everything about him totally and yun nga again in the end he's still confused as to why he has problems yeah mm-hmm. yeah I, I think that's a, that's one of the things that like especially in the scope the broader scope of the novel like Zadie Smith really wants to interrogate and criticize like I, I noticed that um, one of the epigraphs that she had for one of the parts of the book which she lifted from the Elaine Scarry essay on beauty and being just which is where the novel gets its name from um she highlighted the this point about how universities are a precious thing that can be destroyed and i was like really uh, unsure what that meant like did she was she like wholesale calling for the destruction of universities even though they seem <laughs> to have like apparent value what and, is college yeah like yeah what? are we wasting our going. time <laughs> Right. So we figure it out. And especially because this book comes out in like 2005. So like people are like starting yeah. like, wait a minute, do we really need to? like? Should we go to school? But like when I then I... I you think the PNP read this and was like, got it. <laughs> but like I skimmed, I saw I skimmed through the scary, the Elaine scary essay. And yes. seeing where that part fit into place, you see that that's not at all scary's position where she ends up saying like, for us to go and be educated, that sort of implies us wanting to be close to beauty because we go to school to learn more about beautiful learn, objects yeah. and to how to broaden our vision towards it. So it seems... Is this your Dockmore thing? Yeah, I think so. But like, this is sort of things like we were also like, at least for Mandy and me, we, we were like learning a lot or talking about a lot in our majors courses where... Trying to figure out the position of beauty in mm-hmm. like human endeavor, mm-hmm. because like in everyday life, right? Because even in that essay, Elaine Scarry, her overall objective is to try to restore the discussion of beauty in the humanities. Uh, um, whereas she see like at the time she had seen like it was sort of disappearing, and and it's something that is reflected very much in the things that Howard talks about, where he he doesn't care if you like or don't like the painting. He wants you to be properly intellectual about the discussion. Like, what is Rembrandt? Yeah. Like, you know, like, can you like have a contrarian position to yes, the commonly yes. held view? Right? You know that right. part with the. Of course, you know that part because you read the book. Duh. But like, there's this one part right in the book where like, um, Lady Smith brings in a minor character who we never see. Yes. Again. Her name is oh Katie. Oh my gosh, Katie. Yeah. Oh, the girl like, like, who this cries. Bad, this, cha- this chapter was so. Is she creepy. the one who cries every time she sees that one specific painting? Is no, she's right? the one. Is that she's the one? She's the who one like, who is in Claire. Picasso is like the greatest artist. Yeah, I've yeah, ever yeah. Seen. That's right. And that's then right. like she goes to the oh, Rembrandt yeah. class, and she's like, Rembrandt's the coolest artist I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> and she but can't then like every bring time, herself to speak yeah, yeah, yeah. up. Yeah, every time she tries to participate in uh, 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 Howard Belsey's class, uh, it's implied. It the book suggests that the language is so fucking esoteric um, in the discussion where Howard is like. We're talking about the quasi mythem of the the hoo ha that the yeah Mitch yeah such yeah, a, yeah. Buda, buda, buda. and then Katie's like I don't know what to say and then she looks at herself in the mirror and she curses her youth and she curses her mind <laughs> which is so sad like honestly <laughs> yeah, like like, like this is peak like I was born in the wrong generation yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah and to tie it back like it it's the sort of thing where it, she like Smith is making it clear like she's not like also like calling the man for. Yeah, the abolition of universities at all, but like kind of like seeing these are the elements that are also making people think that oh, universities should be abolished because yeah. yeah, you have these people who are like trying to push forward their own ideas and like force them upon other people and then make them convince them into thinking that they're thinking for themselves, but you know, they are just think rethinking the thoughts that the professors are teaching them rather than like fostering this appreciation in Katie for the things that she actually likes and learning how to develop her own, like, I guess, sense of taste once she gets out of university and all these things. Mm. Mm. In that particular part, it's also um, Zadie Smith's way of like uh, illustrating the power dynamic, which is so inherent in universities. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Right. When, when Howard is giving his lecture with this very esoteric language, um, 
he'll say something uh he'll ask a question or he'll be like any questions and he expects already a gap of silence to follow yeah after he says his that's piece. right yeah and, that's true and then and then he says like when he was a young teacher he would be unsure in these silences like did i explain myself correctly but then mm-hmm. he realized um as he um gain more experience in the university that that silence is something that you look for that's how you know you're respected oh my that's god you yeah know that's you yeah <laughs> your students yeah and literally students are dumb like yeah. that's what he's basically saying <laughs> and, fear me yeah like yeah like we have yeah. we have all seen um teachers flex in this way yeah like they'll say some Absolutely. deep ass shit knowing that you can't yeah. you yeah. won't be able to respond yeah. to it yeah um, and then but they're like just like eh, now what yeah yeah yeah, yeah. They're, they're like but what are your thoughts? What I just asked if I could. And go then to he the takes a swig from his fucking uh, thermos. Coffee. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is super. Yeah, that's super sad. I mean, like, I definitely find myself like leaning in agreement towards this kind of criticism towards the university culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like I, I mean, like I, I see the way. Like I've always like felt like people who speak in that overly intellectual register. Like my bullshit monitor just like goes off. Like, no, nah, I don't think this guy knows what he's talking about, or yeah, like he's absolutely. deliberately trying to confuse us. Like, yeah, yeah, because like, you don't really know that and, though and when trying... you're like eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one. Right. Yeah, you don't have yeah. that radar yet. But that yeah, that's yeah. sort of the thing. And, and, and you all, you end up thinking I should be like this because there's something mm-hmm. that he knows that I don't. But that's also the mm-hmm. part I think where universities and especially like faculties and departments have to also meet the students halfway absolutely because it's one of those things where it's like we can't force you to like come on this guy's go a teacher. straight he knows what to he's <laughs> yeah go straight to doctorate level like you have to yeah. you know we have to reassess we have to find out what do yeah. you know and then can we meet you there and then can we bring you can we walk you upstairs yeah. you know that sort of thing absolutely, absolutely. Uh, okay. and and of course that abuse of power like extends to all these other things like for, like Claire. For one thing, yeah, for, there's the affairs that Howard has. So we find out in the first part, like, Howard... Okay, this is a weird thing for me, but, like, um, in like after the whole thing about Jerome being de- uh, shortly engaged to Victoria, the book jumps forward nine months, and then there's, like, this sort of, like, throwaway mention, like, oh, and also Howard... Uh, slept with someone. Uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Like, wait, wait, what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like no, yeah. Thing. The way that, the, yeah, the way that they talked about it, the way that you realized that, that that was a thing, pa, is like, yeah, you know how my family's been like kind of tense because my dad slept with that lady, but like, <laughs> yeah, like yeah, we've all moved on now like, because Jerome wanted to like, yeah, marry this child. This is a big thing. <laughs> yeah, and it's literally like, whoa, whoa, whoa! Can we backtrack? You say he what? Yeah, and it kind of like plants that idea in your mind until like the book then corrects itself and it like goes like, actually, it wasn't a one night stand. It was exactly. a three week affair that Howard mm-hmm. had with one of his colleagues, Claire Malcolm. Uh, who teaches Who's poetry. Who's a poet. She's poet. a poet. She teaches poetry mm-hmm. workshops at Wellington. Um, so there's, It's not revealed immediately, but yeah, it doesn't take yeah. long. It doesn't take long. Until we realize that she's the, uh, that she's the one that uh, Howard cheated on. That's right. Yeah. And, and it's one of those things where, like, even when Kiki discovers that her husband has been having an affair with this woman, she, like, immediately does this thing of comparison, like, comparing herself to Claire... And, like, I think it's one of those... It's an intentional thing that Smith wanted her to... Wanted Kiki to be, like... Like, she wanted Howard to be small and white. And she wanted Kiki to be big and black. And have that immediate... So that when you see who Howard has affairs with, you make those immediate comparisons. Yeah. Um, And they're not difficult comparisons to make. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And especially yeah. in terms of like Kiki's like reflection of herself and looking back to her past. Yeah, and like going it, when it goes into that fight that I mentioned earlier, she, the way that she describes Claire by is like she's a fucking leprechaun, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, I could, you Shit. slept with somebody I could put in my fucking pocket. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, get it? Yeah, and she was like, she's white and tiny, and I'm like, what she says, my leg weighs. More than she does. <laughs> yeah, which, my one leg. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you have all these abuses of power. And then, obviously, later on, he gets into another affair 
Yeah. Which is even oh, worse. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, just going back to the abuse of power of Claire. Yeah. Because of the affair, she... I did not mean to... <laughs> spoken word that. But, like, because of her <laughs> affair with... Sorry. Because of her affair with, with Howard, when Zora eventually tries her hand to get at getting into her class, it parang she doesn't get in. Like, she fails. But then she knows... That she shouldn't have failed because she knows no one that she's kind of good. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Up... Yes. Sorry, sorry. Go on. Sorry. I'll, okay. After you. No, because I was gonna say, and then she, so she knows. Okay. So in her mind, she's like, I know that you, that this person is abusing me this way because she's upset that my dad broke up with her. So I'm basically gonna make some bong to the dean. Yeah. And then that's also another abuse of power on her, and as the child of a prof at the school yeah. because she basically says mm. you know tells like the dean see dean french like this shouldn't be a thing and yeah. i don't want to keep talking about it but we have to talk about it and he's like you're right i don't want to fucking talk about that fucking affair ever again so i'm going to talk to her and then there it goes from there that's where claire ends up in his office and then she reads that fucking poem yeah to yeah, him, yeah. And okay he's like, but this is not what this is about <laughs> <laughs> let's preface this though because like um um, the book sort of presents the affair between Howard Belsey and Claire Malcolm as the event that really sets things into motion. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, and one way that Zora um, uh, responds to this is she kind of like shuts it out. Like she's the um, – she's objectively like whatever. I don't care. This is not my problem. I'm trying to like, you know, get recommendations from professors and shit. And I'm going to get a recommendation from Claire Malcolm who – for all her bullshit, is one of the most acclaimed professors in the university. Yeah. You know, what matters more to her is not so much the relationship between her parents, which she kind of blames her mom on, um, for. uh, But she's also like, whatever, I'm just going to be like, I'm going to go into this brute force um, and I'm going to get into this class in a way so that she can prove to herself that she's not affected and she cares more about the, the... the, the mind. intellect, the pure intellect of the thing, right? And you know, yeah. emotions that could get in her way. Um, that being said, um, it m- would be interesting to like read these three children, and I don't know if this like interpretation is ha- holds any water. There's like this id ego super ego situation oh, going on. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Oh, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Right. Right among uh, Zora, uh, Levi. Is yeah. it Levi or yeah, Levi? Levi. Levi. Levi I went to with Levi, like the Bible. Yeah, I've been reading. I've been reading Levi this entire time. <laughs> I've been reading Levi also. So uh, Zora, Zora, Levi, and Jerome. Jerome, Jerome yeah. is like the uh, the uh, um... no no no. no. Um, uh, Zora is the id who's like, are we right or wrong? Um, right. Okay. And I think Jerome must be the id who is like, does this feel good or does this not feel good? Does this feel right? Does this not feel right? Um, right. And yeah, uh, that's good. I like and this. like uh, Levi is sort of like this saggy pants be with the people super ego, you know what is yeah, justice? Yeah. That's what he's yeah. always thinking. And, and even though he's putting on a front all the time to like get to that idea of what justice is. See what I what I really like about that reading is that that's also a reflection of what's going on at least more in Kiki's mind than in Howard's mind. Howard is like really repressing. <laughs> that sense of like moral judgment but like with kiki you can see her kind of starting to question everything that has been like she's been sort of like letting herself believe while she's been married to howard yes Mm. yeah so so it's it's a very yeah yeah i I really like that idea that this is sort of reflecting also the relationship between the parents and sort of what the, the values of the parents are like passing on to their kids Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To, to also to your point, Jamda, you mentioned earlier um, the whole thing about Zora kind of brushing things off to go forward with her in, her, her academic career, her intellectual career, quote unquote. It, it's sort of that. I mean, like without like you and I have both been in writing workshops, mm-hmm. and without like necessarily like citing like specific instances of things that we went through necessarily, but things that we've observed while like being writers and seeing how the writing world, at least here in the Philippines, is going. Yeah, and pursuing success on an institutional Yeah, there, there is that sort of thing going on as well, where it's like the nepotism is definitely there. Like, you can't really get through unless you make the connections with the old mm-hmm. guard. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, uh, speaking of the old guard, right? Um, because we can honestly say Howard, who is like not yet a tenured professor, but is on his way to be. Yeah. Right. Um, Howard is the old guard. Claire Malcolm is the old guard. Jack French, um, who uh, Zadie Smith uh, takes the time to tell us, is more interested in etymologies than poetry. Right. Um, is the old guard. Um, uh, one one interesting part of the book um, is when Zora brings her case to Jack French and she uses a very key word, um, which is inappropriate. Right, right. right. Um, and um, as soon as Zora bells, like the uh, the fraughtness of the situation aside, it's only when Zora uses the word inappropriate that Jack French is like, oh my God, there it is. There's the word inappropriate. Right. And Jack French, when he goes to speak to Claire Malcolm about letting Zora into Claire Malcolm's class, um, Jack French is like, you know, we don't want people to talk. We don't want people to say um, that this is inappropriate. You know, Zora called this inappropriate. And Claire Malcolm is like, oh, no way. She used that word. We don't want to be inappropriate. I, I, I'll I, be a cheater. <laughs> yeah. But like, like, like we, we can be like um, stuck up pompous academics all we want. But God forbid we be inappropriate. Right. You know, um, so which is to say that, um, how do I put it? Even though it's presented a little caricaturishly here, but also very realistically, um, the academic institution or the old guard, that's the virtue that they hold highest more than anything. Right. You know, more right. than more than loving things, more, in, more than seeing the beauty of things. Um, their main occupation um, intellectually and even spiritually is like, what, what is inappropriate? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And again, that sort of circles back to like the things that are happening with Katie, where in her own way, like what she's experiencing is a kind of inappropriateness where the discussion is being hogged by the daughter of the professor and the daughter of the rival of the professor. Uh huh. You know, Sadie Smith has a unique talent of like bringing all these like volatile elements together. Right. Right. Yeah. Because like for anyone listening, yeah. Um, uh, Zora ends up in Howard's class, but also Victoria Kipps also ends up in Howard's class. Yeah. Okay. And I, Katie's just like a, a, a character in the background who's like, "What the fuck?" Yeah. Wait. You okay. Know? I think she we, doesn't even know about the drama going on. I think that like uh, like underlying sort of the, that part of the plot because we didn't really like uh, gloss we glossed over it. So what happens is that um, the Belzies find out is that Monty Kipps has gotten a position at Wellington. And the entire Kipps family is moving to Wellington as well. Uh, you know, that doesn't bode well for Jerome. And thankfully, mm-hmm. he has to go to Boston to study. So he's out of the picture. Um, we learn that uh, Victoria is going to enroll in Wellington. And she ends up enrolling in Howard's class. So you have uh, How- um, Victoria and Zora in as, as students in Howard's class, like hogging the discussion, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um other things that happen in that first part, the Belzies also make the acquaintance of a young man named Carl. Uh, another scene, actually, by the way, mm-hmm. that um, that uh, Zadie Smith got straight out from Howard's End is um, there's a scene where they're supposedly in a concert and she steals the umbrella of the Carl. Oh, character. instead of a disc man, <laughs> instead of a Walkman, which like oh. obvi- yeah, for obvious reasons they could not do yeah. that in Edwardian in time. The, yeah, in the seventeen hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but like uh, so, um, and and we find out Carl is a very talented poet. Uh, a very talented. In, sorry, in the original, is he also a poet? No. Okay, so the way that they do it in in um, Howard's End is that he is a working class fellow who um, aspires to academic reading. Like, oh. he, he goes to... Like, they meet him at a performance of Beethoven's Fifth. Okay. Uh, and it's... And, like, the way it's, like, sort of fostered... Oh, this is the meaning of the music. And, yeah. like, he's very intellectually curious, but he doesn't really have the time for it. Like, yeah. there's a scene in the film... Because he has no money? Yeah, where... There's a scene in the film where he's literally reading at work when he's not uh-huh. filling out insurance papers. Uh- <laughs> and he's very much a guy where... Like, he's very, at some point, kind of like Carl, he gets disillusioned by that Mm -hmm. um, sort of um, academic loftiness that people in upper classes enjoy. 
Like, there's right. a scene I remember where the Carl character in Howard's End is like, yeah, but, you know, that's only... Reading is only there for you to make you feel good after your dinners. Um, which is like, shit! Y- yeah, know? I'm like, okay, dude. <laughs> I guess he's got, got it. it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which is something that, like, sort of Carl kind of ends up going through mm-hmm. until he also becomes, like, absorbed into the system. In, in school, yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, but when we meet Carl, like, he's this very talented... Wait, I forget. Like, is he, like, described as a talented rapper or a Rap- talented... Po- yeah. He would rather say poet. Right, mm. that he like he would identify better as a as a spoken word poet because I remember when when Levi listens to the disc, he's always like, "Is this your flow?" Like he says, "Is this your song?" And he's like, "I guess," but it's more of po- like he descri- he would rather describe it as poetry. Right. And then when when Zora <laughs> Zora like is kind of. Um, I would say that her reaction was kind of classist mm-hmm. because she really was like, why the fuck would I like take your disc, man? And then the way she tries to defend herself, I was like, well, I put it under my chair, like as if to imply now, nah, how else would it get in your hands? Yeah. <laughs> Unless if you, you didn't tried. fucking, yeah. yeah, if you didn't take it. And I literally was like, Zora, chill out. Yeah. This is probably the only other black person here yeah. besides you. Yeah, like is, literally. Yeah, which is the observation Kiki makes. She's like, she yeah. was like feeling so proud. Like, oh, we're so classy. We're probably yeah. the only black people black here. Black people here. <laughs> yeah. Looks at them, like, oh, except for that guy. <laughs> except, except for that guy. Yeah, exactly. And then like, again, relating to Kiki, when she goes back, when and when they have that fight about Claire, she says something that's like, um, I literally don't have black friends. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Like she's she, she her whole life has been whiteness ever since it's she was yeah. with, with Howard. And then I guess that's also why she's so affected when, you know, this jumping ahead, but when um Mrs. Kipps passes because that's her first Siguro black friend in Right, Zorong. right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Okay, so we, we have to like preface this again with Another key difference um, between the Belsies and the Kips mm-hmm. uh, is that um, uh, Howard is liberal but white, whereas mm-hmm. Monty Kips is conservative but, but an black. immigrant. Yeah, he's an, a trinidad yeah. yeah. Which is like, um, how do you do that? You know? Yeah. Um, that, that's something that sort of like befuddles uh, Howard, kind of, sort of. Um, and mm-hmm. makes it difficult for him to like uh, make his case that this man is basically trying to destroy Roe v. Wade, which is one way that yeah. he put it in one part of the book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or like even the, the the broader sense that this man is trying to take the liberal out of liberal he, arts. The, yeah, yeah, I was about to say. I was about to say the fact that like this white man is the one who's like, guys, he's trying to make sure we don't have affirmative action, and this black dude is like, who fucking needs affirmative action when you have art? <laughs> <laughs> And then, and, and then, and like, Jesus, and Jesus, art, and Jesus, and then the thing also, like, the like one of the things, mm, uh, what's his name? Howard also doesn't really like about Monty is that he looks down on black art, right? right? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. He, I, ironically, and V also hates that about him because she's like, I hate that you like, parang the way that he looks at black art is like it's there for the sake of history, but not really. For that it doesn't mean anything for real. Yeah. Like he doesn't want it because he's like everyone keeps trying to politicize it, but what for? It's it's one of those conservative like notions na parang it's like like when when rich people are like, well, if poor people just stop being really complainy yeah. about everything, maybe yeah. things will go their way. And he's like the same thing w- with like political art and art in general. Na right. If we were to make things a bit more pure and a bit more I guess god centric then maybe black people would ha- would stop having a hard time. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but that also ends up becoming sort of the source of the narrative irony for the Kipses. Because, right. so we have this whole thing with Kiki and Carly and uh, Monty's wife, where Kiki becomes friends with Carly. And as you're saying, Carly is sort of her first black friend. Um, and she ends up being really honest and open with Carly and... And she also learns that Carlene is sort of slowly suffering from some chronic illness that is not really disclosed. Um, yeah. And the way they're able to, like, bridge uh, the political divide between them. Because, like, um, yeah. Monty and Howard hate each other. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right? And I, I believe it's Kiki or Carlene um, who makes the point that all this shit going on is just husbands fighting each other while their families are caught in the crosshairs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, Kiki 
and um, Carly and are able to bridge those political divides because, well, uh, the na- I, this is kind of a naive way to put it, is because they're mature enough to, you know, put their differences they're women. aside. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> but, Thank, that's it. You take it, Mandy. You take it. You take yeah. It. I don't know literally, anything. <laughs> that's, what, that, that's literally what I was thinking. I was like, he better just say that it's because they're women because that's, yeah. what it, that's what it is. <laughs> I mean, right, because, like, eventually then when they have that big conversation where Kiki finds out that, you know, she's sick, that Carlene is sick, and that's also where Carlene helps her realize, um, Carlene is basically the one that makes her realize that she wasted, not really yeah, wasted, yeah. but, you know, like, that she gave up 30 years of her fucking life for, for nothing. For Howard, yeah. Yeah, for Howard. <laughs> so nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> Correct, same, same. Um, yeah, like, parang that section, that the, that whole part is some of the most, if not the most, I think, w- women, woman centric of the whole book, right. in the sense that, parang I think it it it's supposed to yun yeah, show that it's supposed to emphasize that yun yeah, these men are just doing this for nothing. It's all just like intellectual yeah. checking off for nothing. And, yeah. Whereas there's really no issue, and th- they were able to resolve even one of their marital issues right. in the span of a scene. And then they just end up dragging it on for the rest of this fucking book. Yeah, okay. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, while we're on the relationship between uh, Carlene and Kiki, um, what came to mind strangely enough was this um, a poem in fifteen tweets by Raphael Bob Waxberg, who listeners might know as the creator of BoJack Horseman. Oh. Um, and this tweet is called "Does Marge Have Friends?" and it talks about Marge Simpson. Um, oh, specifically about her her um, her social life or well implicitly non-existent social life in the universe of the Simpsons may I read it for you oh please do oh this is go okay. ahead I'm actually now like in my head I'm like oh no yeah yeah go okay so so does Marge have friends who are Marge's friends is it Helen Lovejoy is Helen Lovejoy a friend Sarah Wiggum Agnes Skinner To whom does Marge spill her secrets over coffee on cold days? Who laughs at Marge's jokes? Who knows Marge truly and well? Who tells Marge to leave the brute, knowing she won't? You don't have to stay. You deserve so much more. Who, on a morning walk, sees a tall blue bush, texts a photo to Marge, this made me think of you, surely not Lenny, or Kirk, or Luan. Did Marge mourn for Maud Flanders? Late nights at the kitchen table staring at her own hands. Is she haunted still by her absence? Does she see in her late neighbor a cautionary tale, seldom remembered? Semi-anonymous Maud. Could this fate too befall Marge? Perhaps once at a summer barbecue, when both were still alive, Maud grabbed Marge's hand under the table and held tight. What prompted this sudden connection? This sudden expression of, what was it, warmth? The two weren't close. Acquaintance is sure. Have they ever hugged? And yet here they were, holding hands silently, secretly, while their children shrieked and their husbands grilled the hot dogs. One night, Marge couldn't sleep. The linens hung to dry in the yard, flapping in the wind with unprecedented accent. Marge wandered into the night, a fleck of yellow and a blanket of white stars, and she felt, as she often did, alone. Marge felt the sharp grass on her feet, the breeze on her face. Over the fence, she saw Maud, pale as a sheet, her eyes wet with tears. Marge looked to her. Maud? And Maud shook her head. And Maud whispered this. It's not the calm before the storm that frightens me. It's the calm that follows. <laughs> now this is very interesting. Yeah. Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> now, let, let's... let's... Let's break this down. Please do. I, I'm just uh, going to here in awe. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm really... The, every line, I literally was like, where is this going? Am I going to be... But it ain't like that. <laughs> yeah, but it ain't like that. Exactly. You should have ended it like that. You should have been like, but it ain't like that. <laughs> no, okay, okay, okay. But, 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 okay. Very interesting parallel- parallelisms here. Um, while Flanders and Monty Kipps are very different people, Flanders was also Christian, right? Um, very yeah. devoted Christian, which is yeah, which That's is amazing to me. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and um, what? But the point that this fifteen tweet poem uh, wants to make is that um, because of uh, 
what's the word, short-sighted or misguided writing. Um, the the Simpsons kind of failed to give Marge a social life, a place where she could be herself. Yeah. Um, the yeah. Simpsons made Marge Simpson a fully uh, family woman, a devoted yeah. wife, a devoted mother. Um, mm-hmm. And that's all the show forces us to perceive her to be. Yeah. Um, so... And even in the episodes where she does stuff, like I remember one of the first episodes I ever saw of The Simpsons was when she got this job as a like a singer in like a themed restaurant, and she had she she would sing "I Shot the Sheriff," (laughs) and uh, (laughs) and I remember like even then, like afterwards, you're like, does she even keep friends from that job? And also, mm-hmm. and like, and then, and then, like the 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 like most extraordinary thing about it was that Marge has a job, like that was supposed to be the bit right, right. that yeah, she yeah, goes yeah. out of her way to have a job and have a life outside of oh, the family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, then yeah. when when they go to see one of her shows, I I think uh, I could be wrong about this, but I I apparently know that the kids find it kind of weird, not because it's like oh that's our mom, but it's more like is this what can moms do this? <laughs> And then they mm-hmm. never really address that again. Na parang, sh- y- tama, does Marge have friends? Who else kaya has ha- saw her doing those shows if not mm-hmm. like yeah. just her family at that one one time? Yeah. And after that episode, she's consigned to go back to her To go back, yeah. Family like, life. She doesn't have that job again. So Meanwhile, Homer is cis-heteropatriarchally privileged yeah. <laughs> to yeah. be able to yeah. like go to the bar and like yeah. hang out They're with his friends with and his be a friends. drunk and work at a nuclear um, plant Plant. Um and the right and the, what Raphael Bob Waxberg and Zadie Smith are trying to illustrate here is that through this relationship between two women while their husbands are doing their bullshit, uh, mm-hmm. right? This is in this space where only they know where to find each other. This is where they can reclaim agency, autonomy, Absolutely. yeah, be who they Absolutely. are, um, and. I think this is where the central tension of on beauty surfaces, which is mm-hmm. that um, uh, on beauty is about the incongruence between the politics and the belief systems that we wield and the precarity of our relationships. Right. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because that's that's the whole thing. Like, like, what good Absolutely. is it that you believe in these things if um, the relationships you keep are... Mm-hmm. Uh, going badly or just mm-hmm. not or you're not keeping them at all yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. exactly yeah. i feel mm. i i think when when uh what's her name kiki said that you know like she again spent 30 years of her life for for howard i feel the fact that she says it in the way na parang it's it's like she still separates it na it's howard and not to do anything with the kids Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't think a mother... Well, I, I don't know. This this is me just generalizing also. But, like, I feel that way with my mom as well. Parang she would never say that she wasted her life raising me. Yeah. And I don't think that... She, I don't think Kiki would say the same thing about the kids. Yeah. You're like, she's like, mm-hmm. yes, this was such a wasteful 30 years of not knowing who I am. Of gaining all this weight. Of, like, losing you to, like, a leprechaun woman. Right. But... It's more like this but, was supposed but I didn't to be waste, good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. This is supposed to be good because we have three beautiful, like, um, intelligent children. Sort of. I don't know if she really feels that way. <laughs> well, depends. I don't know if she really feels that way because sometimes when she talks about Zora also, she's always like, she feels like an outsider then. Yeah. And then when she talks about Jerome, she's also like... Although there there oh. is some kind of, like, acknowledgement, I think, from the kids that... Um, because, like, I'm thinking especially, like, skipping forward to the end mm-hmm. when... When Kiki oh, does right. eventually like separate yeah. from yeah. Howard, uh, mm-hmm. there is an aspect of the kids being like, "Yeah, we're okay with this. We we don't mind living with our dad, but we know that our mom mm-hmm. has to have her own place. Like this is yeah. it's time for her to have that agency yeah. now for once yeah. in her life." Right. So um, we've got okay. We've got down Carl. We've got down Carleen. Uh, <laughs> We've no got, relation. Yeah, all the relation. Yeah, yeah. Weird, <laughs> weird that that happened. We've got the whole thing down with Claire. Um, so when Carlene passes away, oh right, this was something I wanted to bring up earlier with the whole narrative irony of um, Monty not really being supportive of black art 
Because one of the narrative thrusts in the third part of the novel is that after Carleen passes away, she ends up bequeathing a painting oh, right. to Kiki. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's, the it's supposed Haitian to be, one? yeah, it's supposed to be like this, uh, yeah, like a, a Haitian painting. Mm-hmm. And it's supposed to be very valuable. Yeah. And and they bonded over it like exactly yeah, they, one time. Right, exactly. Just once. The now, one time. Now, the funny thing is when you go to Howard's End, it's not a painting. It's Ooh. the whole house. It's the whole Oh, estate. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, oh. that painting could be as much as a yeah, no, actual exactly. fucking That's estate true. anyway. So. That's true. Or, or a hospital. In this, as Levi, or a hos- uh, in this economy, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Empathically claims. But like, mm-hmm. um, the, thing, the thing there is that once the Kipses find out, like, oh, okay, she's meant to have the painting, they immediately erase um, all uh, like perceivable evidence that they can find of it. They like they burn the note, the promissory note that Carlene wrote before she died. They burn it in the fire, and mm-hmm. they never mention it. And Monty has the painting moved into his office. Office at school. So like, there's a part of it where it's like, oh, okay, yeah, sure, he doesn't want to like support black art, but. He'll, he knows it's he'll clearly protect this interest because he knows it, it's very valuable for yeah. himself and his yeah. family. Um, you know, and I think that's also something that speaks to, I guess, when Kiki and Carlene are are becoming closer. One of the things that they sort of admit to each other is this mutual knowledge that well, we both know our husbands are more or less hypocrites. Like, mm-hmm. like Monty yeah. is friends with a with a gay minister, but he'll never admit it. Like, he'll never admit that that guy's actually gay. Mm. And that's right. And you've got—I mean, we, we've, we're seeing throughout the whole novel this whole thing about Howard um, trying to be progressive, but mm-hmm. ended up ending up just like playing every, you know, every play in the bad guy Stereotype. book. Stereotype, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, you definitely have that. Um, mm-hmm. After she passes away, after Carlene passes away, you have Howard getting into an affair with Victoria, which. Mm-hmm. Oh boy! Oh boy, I, indeed. I mean, we were talking about abuse of power earlier, but oh boy, um, oh boy. here we go. This is really something else. But mm-hmm. also because, like, this is something that kind of just gets like revealed offhandedly at the end. But there is like a secret subplot that's also happening on the side where Monty is also getting into yeah. his own. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that scene. Power okay, can I just say just really one, that yeah. medjo? Yeah, is that the thing about this book also is that it's compared to Autograph Man, I guess. And kind of white teeth. This book is kind of funny. Yeah. And like, yeah. It and, is funny. And that bit where Kiki goes to the house to talk to to talk to the Kipsis house to talk to Monty. And then that girl, what's her name? Is it Charlene or something? Chantel. Chantel. And yeah. Chantel comes rushing out and Kiki's like, oh my god, is she okay? <laughs> yeah. Like, that kind of was so funny to me because like it must have looked so weird. Like the way that it, that scene was described. Seemed so hilarious, and then Monty being like, "I was, j- she just wanted to, uh, uh more credits studying. for You're another right. class because, and yeah, she yeah. does she not want to fail, not- and she knows she knows that I cannot speak for her, and she's very <laughs> upset." And Kiki was like, "Okay, didn't ask, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway." <laughs> Um, yeah. So anyway, I'm sorry your wife died. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like literally. Yeah, yeah. Like, I literally came here for you. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry your wife died. <laughs> like, can you imagine Monty playing it, playing it like if this was a scene? I can imagine Monty being like, "My what? Oh, my wife." Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> that. Yeah, that's yeah. that happened recently. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ooh, that wife. Yeah. So you have like these like parallel abuses of power happening. Um, that don't get revealed to the, towards the end while you have also the children I think with the exception maybe of Jerome because he's like far away and he's just like mm-hmm. allowed to be by himself like you have um, Levi becoming closer to this uh, group of Haitians who are selling pirated goods after he quits his job in the megastore mm-hmm. um, and he started realizing like at first like he's shy about his status but mm-hmm. he realizes that that notion has to be challenged as well for him to be able to uh Put, connect yeah or to have solidarity for for mm-hmm. this group of people yeah um absolutely. while you have zora um she's trying to stand up for carl because carl is now in claire's class and mm-hmm. even though carl is not really like even though he's like being absorbed into the system and even though he's like yeah i guess i'm gonna start writing like real poems now like i'm gonna try experimenting with different forms 
like he's not really interested in the class. And yeah. the way that ends up sort of saving him is that uh, Zora ends up saving him is that she gets Claire to convince the Black Studies Erskine. Department head to give him a job, and he ends up becoming like this mm-hmm. archivist for a for bl- like hip hop, yeah, for hip hop and rap, mm-hmm. uh, which he really loves, and he mm-hmm. gets absorbed into the system, and then to the point that when Levi meets him again, he's no longer endeared to him because he's yeah. no longer relying on him for. I guess, like, his sense of identity. Right? Yeah, validity, yeah. that sort of thing. Um, Actually, guys, let's, uh, let's, let's backtrack just a little bit okay. and talk about how um, Claire Malcolm, specifically, and the rest of her poetry class encounter Carl. Right. <laughs> oh, oh, that's, that's true. <laughs> You're right. That's very kind true. Of we literally that. planned this. But, <laughs> okay. Um, so, how, how... Let's go there. <laughs> like, let, let's talk first about, like, um, how Carl ends up, like, uh, dipping his feet into the waters of the university, and then let's yeah. talk about uh, how so Howard also, um, yeah. like sort of like his origin story. But let's go to Carl oh, first. Come on, origin story. Okay, so basically, there's a gig. <laughs> there is a gig, and remember those guys. Um, that one. Um, so, so there was there's basically a gig, and so the the way that Claire's class works is that she. Is and I never got to explain this in my own time in university, but Mio did, even in our university here and when he was abroad. But like sometimes you would go on like mini field trips where you could go to places that like obvious not not just museums and stuff, but like um play events where that would be like congruent to your class and stuff. And so what Claire did was that she would take them to like poetry readings, and then coincidentally there was this one gig this one night at this place called the bus stop. Which, mm-hmm. of course, there would be a poetry gig mm-hmm. at a place called The Bus Stop. And the mm-hmm. place by is described to be like a basement thing, right? Yeah, like, yeah. This whole, <laughs> like, does that like, ring any bells so, for you? Yeah, I literally Have you been to any like, basements <laughs> in the last few years? <laughs> where there were you guys gigs? Ever, I know. Performing Under poetry. a Kowloon house, maybe. <laughs> Some house of Kowloon. Oh, man. Anyway, so... Um, so they go there and then, no, but like, even if you think of like the poetry place in like, um, extremely goofy movie, you know, that was yeah. like an underground thing. It was under, oh my god, <laughs> right? Diba? And so I literally, that life part I was like, is okay, like a this, lime, guys. exactly, guys. Life is like a lime, y'all. And, um, when, when they go to this, they're the first acts are not that great, right? Yeah. And they're not really endeared to it. And that's basically part of the lesson, then I guess, in my, that's how I kind of they, they clear. Were- they were poems that walked so that the 22 Jump Street it spoken word run. scene could run. Could run 100% <laughs> could run. Could fly. This, J- Zadie Smith wrote this in 2005, so 2012 could, like, soar. Yeah. But, like, um, and and then Levi and his group of friends, the Haitians, are also there, and he's being weird about it. Like, Zora's like, are you gonna fucking perform or some shit? And he's like, oh, I don't know, it depends on, the, like, the mood of my friends. And she's like, what the fuck is that supposed to mean? And then they find out what it's supposed to mean. And he, they basically, like... They do, do some their, sab- like, Yeah, they basically <laughs> recite, like, a whole thing together about, you know, like, the system and all that shit. And then... They go out like Z- uh, Zadie, um, Zora, Zora and uh, Claire go out for a while, and they like have a smoke together, and they're like talking, and then suddenly somebody like comes up, and they're like, "Yo, you gotta go back inside because somebody like this is amazing. What's going on?" And they're like, "What's going? On? What's happening?" There's and, this guy. There's a, he's on the mic right now, and he's killing and it right he's now. He's killing it. Like it's insane. And they're and they're like, oh, this better be good. We're fucking sp-. like Zora's like, are you sure? Because we're smoking. And I literally <laughs> was like, okay, college student. <laughs> and then was like, I have said this in the past. Um, and then so they go back in, and and it turns out to be Carl, and. And Zora's like, holy shit, I fucking know that guy. And Claire's like, do you really? And because she's starting to be enamored by his whole set, I guess. And, um, it's, like, Zadie doesn't really say what he's saying up yeah, until, like, his yeah. last bit, I think. And his whole, I guess in summary, is uh, that this whole stanza that she presents to us about, like, what his work is like is basically him 
uh, also shitting on the system, but I guess because he has like music and a really solid flow, yeah, yeah. it gets it gets the people going yeah. like yeah, a, yeah. A, a bit better. <laughs> and Claire is so enamored by him that she she's like Zora, you gotta introduce us to him and she's like why the fuck would i do that <laughs> and and she, she's like no come on like he can be in the class like i want him to be in the class and that's eventually what happens and and he accepts the offer kind of reluctantly but like he is i he's guess on top he of the also world. he just won the slam yeah sure. yeah yeah he I got wins time. The, yeah he's like yeah i can do this whatever and then that's eventually and then it's basically his storyline or his arc segues into what Mia just said you know like he Zora has to fight for his place at the school because Monty doesn't want to have these extra you know like outsider non-enrolled students in the school because he thinks it's not productive etc etc and then she ends yeah, up Yeah that's another part him. of his like uh, meritocratic uh, philosophy regarding uh, education Right yeah, yeah. yeah it's like you gotta pay to be Where- here <laughs> Yeah, right. whereas Claire Malcolm is like, we have to extend these privileges to other people who can't yeah, afford them. Right, yeah, right. Exactly. And Zadie Smith, like, the book suggests that Claire Malcolm does this, like, partly because uh, she's guided by her political and moral compass, but also because it makes her feel good. Yeah. Yeah, I was about you know to say, I mean? like, she, she, the, one of the first introductions about Claire, before you find out that she has slept with Howard, is that she was a, a tag team with Howard on a committee for affirmative action, but she didn't do it because she cared because she and she was like not even there in the committee often like she was just she her name was there but like she never really participated that much but then like she still tells people that she was on that committee with howard yeah um mm-hmm. and you yeah, as jem said it was because it probably you know made her feel really good that she was helping people <laughs> really like basically i guess um so yeah so that happens and then um yeah, she, she... Jam, did you want to say something about this scene? Yeah, no, like, um, if I may, my friends. Oh, um, you may. Yeah. Oh, uh, so, I haven't read a lot of uh, Zadie Smith's work. I've read White Teeth on Beauty. I just finished Intimations, which I borrowed from Mags. And mm-hmm. um, I've been right on and off with... Is that ace yeah. essays? Uh, yes, yes. Oh, okay. um, and I've been on and off with Swing Time, which admittedly is hard to me because, read because Agreed. people are fucking rude. Uh, <laughs> like, characters are, like, really rude in that book. Um... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what I realized while I was thinking about Swing Time uh, and On Beauty, um, and I have to say also that the last time I had finished On Beauty, I was in college, but so this was like almost a decade ago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't even know how I was able to like absorb all of that um, uh, young and feckless as I was. Um, mm-hmm. But like one of the things that Zadie Smith is good at, and this is a, th- and I say this because this is something that repetitive- repetitively comes up throughout the book, is that Zadie Smith is really good at writing people who posture and grandstand oh, absolutely yeah, yeah. Yeah. yes right? um Correct. and she and this is partly why the characters in her book for all her talent with um writing psychological acuity is that they're both realistic but also caricaturish like these people are yeah. stereotype stereotypical empty-headed academics but they also have these rich inner lives that we can all purport to have experienced one way or another yeah uh, yeah um and uh like and we can also say like we know people like this you know um yeah. i remember this um when we when in the part of the book where clara malcolm and jack french talk about uh zora's enrollment in the class jack french is like how are you doing um with clara malcolm and clara malcolm is like late to class and clara malcolm is like oh you know how it is jack there's bombs in the east there's <laughs> car- chemical warfare in the west i'm trying to teach poetry over here yeah <laughs> Right, right, right. Um, yeah, absolutely. Right. So she, so for some reason, um, her heart is spacious enough to accommodate all these events of crisis. And then suddenly, when this chaotic, volatile element of Zora Belsi presents herself as a student who wants to enroll in her class, she's like, "What? That's crazy." Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like she, um, there's a there's a clear discrepancy between how radical. Uh, there's the R word again. How radical. Um, many of the characters in the book purport themselves to be and how uh, I guess radical they actually are. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, at some point in the book, Howard has a fucking affair again. Uh, right, with, with Victoria. With none other yeah, than Victoria Kipps. Um, and the way that this happens is, this is fresh out of um, the grieving 
that she's feeling for her mother who had just passed away. Yeah. And Victoria... Literally uh, the day of the funeral, is it not? Yeah, yeah literally. Yeah. The day of the funeral. So there, there, there's an event that prefaces this, actually. Right? So mm-hmm. um, when they get to the chapel for Carlene Kipps' funeral, right? Howard walks out because he has this um, uh, incredible uh, moment of clarity that has to do with death. Um, and he makes a trip to see his father, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, he makes a trip to see his father who was old and who the books... And they're estranged from each other. Like, they haven't seen each other in a long, 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 long time. And the, and we know that because when uh, Howard's dad sees him, he's like, my son, my son, where are you? How, how have you been? Mm, like, yeah. it's been so long. Um, and then we find out from their interaction um, that, well, Howard... Uh, while he doesn't really articulate it as much, um, his he has working class roots, and those working class roots are his father. His father was a butcher. Yeah. Um, but also yeah, like right. the yeah. the the clear stark difference between Howard and his dad is that Howard's dad is like racist as fuck. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um. So, um, from their interaction and how fraught it is, we kind of see that um where Howard's political or moral compass comes from. Um, which is that, um, this is the kind of person that I don't want to be. I, I don't want to be racist. I don't, yeah. uh, I, I want to do good. I want to, uh, uh, be intellectually radical. I'm, I'm better than this, you know? Uh, uh, and it's illustrated by this one interesting, uh, uh, anecdote where, um, Howard's dad's understanding of art is kind of sort of limited to the Mona Lisa. Right. Whereas yeah. Howard had written, uh, paper about like piss in a jar or like shit in a jar or something yeah um one of those modern art pieces uh and so we see from that interaction this thing that howard chose to cut himself off from is that i am going to find a higher sense of thinking and a higher sense of being yeah in the university um even though the university the microcosm of it all the intellectual hoo-ha of it ends up becoming his downfall ends up becoming the site um in which it's uh, his hubris manifests itself right yeah so after he sees his dad um he goes looking for his family because he ran off like without a word like he's trying to live for his family well i just want to put in one like one thing is that it's sort of an interesting like demonstration of his alienation from the working class that Mm. he finds that he's unable to talk to his dad about anything when he goes to him. And then later on, he gets himself drunk at a pub. They just end up watching, like, a game show. Yeah, he ends up... No, I think they watch, like, a football game. And then, like, he sort of becomes, like, buddy-buddy with the people there. But it's sort of implied that that's all accidental and not really by his own, like, intention that he ends up having a good time with the people at the pub. And I think that's like sort of an yeah, interesting yeah. nuance there that, all right, he doesn't want to engage with his father, sure, because of these moral uh, circumstances that, you know, his dad's racist and his dad is a terrible person. But then at the same time, like, he's also lucky enough that if he gets into, like, a situation with people of the same class as his father, like, he could get along with them, but he wouldn't try to do it on his own, on yeah. his own agency. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. yeah. So yeah. he gets drunk at that pub, and then he ends up trying to find his way back to the memorial. Oh, sorry, not not even the memorial, but like the reception after the funeral um, mm-hmm. at the Kipps household. <laughs> and that's that's where he runs into Victoria. Yeah, where the affair he, happens. He, he like stumbles his way through the house. He literally <laughs> walks into the house, yeah, which is so weird, by the way. <laughs> like he literally. He's like, I've been family? here once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, got any? Uh, and, I've and... Been... <laughs> And so he goes in, and he's. What, does he try and eat already? But but either way, he needs to. I remember you. he like he like just steals like somebody's champagne glass. Like he sees it on the table, and he's like, "Well, I guess no one's using this anymore." <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And then and then he goes upstairs because he's like, "Shit, gotta take a wee." And um, and then he accidentally ends up. Uh, going into Victoria's room instead and then he's just like oh shit sorry and then he tries to leave which is fine but then Victoria is like is she already crying? She's yeah. crying. Yeah she's crying. She's, she's like yeah. her world is shattered right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and okay I I have to say also that um, at this time right Victoria's already enrolled in his class um, the book tells us that 
uh, Howard, like, Zadie Smith gives us, like, a lot of, like, weird um, details about Howard noticing that Victoria has, like, got it going on, you know? Um, like, that's his male gaze at work. Just yeah, looking at his students, yeah. Like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but he's just like, okay, whatever. And then um, he stumbles into the room. Victoria locks the door. Um, and then before they have sex, um, the scene in which the book takes its time to tell us that Howard is canonically hung, which is weird. Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. When, <laughs> like, when okay. that part First happened, off, I was like, mm, I don't like this. <laughs> like, like, if you were any other person, I would be so happy for you, but I am not. <laughs> Like, like, so like, upset. okay, you, you don't write a person to be incorrigible and make him, like, huge, okay? Like, yeah, like, literally. Where, like, where, in which fiction I, class wait, do you learn this? Also, exactly, like, or like, is that is that part of Zadie trying to be funny in a part? It's like, well, at least, <laughs> it's so weird because I at remember... least he's got, what's it called again, Jam? What's the thing, the image in Big the book called? Big Dick Energy? Oh, no, what? The, uh, the, the, the his, image, his, your tattoo. Uh, the The dingus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, he's got a pretty big dick. In the nah. back. I hate it. So, oh, I completely forgot about it until you mentioned it, Jam. I think I repressed yeah. it so hard because I was like, "No, I yeah, can't. Like, I don't right, care." This is too much detail. But no, but I was like, I was so surprised because like Howard is has micro dick energy, and then you tell Absolutely. me, absolutely, like he's, he's support. Got a huge... No, he is support as hell. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. It's micro dick and support. Like, yeah. I can't. <laughs> yeah, and and okay. Let let's try to like characterize like the nature of their affair because there's an aspect of it uh, in that scene where he's in her bedroom. She also kind of like confesses to him what it is it that she likes about him, mm-hmm. and and part of it is like her saying that you're probably intellectual. Yeah. Um, and and but then she also basically says like when she's when she says what she likes about him and his teaching and his class, he, he, and he's like, and what about your dad? And she basically says, well, you're the exact opposite. Yeah. And, and I'm part of like, I'm, when, she, when she said that bit, I literally was like, it's not a red flag. Anybody, so, yeah. anyone here want to yeah. see so, the red flag? So like, like in, in a weird way, it's also like the reverse or sort of the same thing that's happening with Jerome trying to resist any association with his father this is like oh, i guess yeah. the furthest that oh. victoria can go is correct like oh all right well the my dad's academic rival literally just walked into my into room. my bedroom mm-hmm. might as well sit on his yeah <laughs> <laughs> guys guys this is where this is where the tomato analogy comes in this is going to be oh yes that's right that's right, how right, right? she does it yes 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 that's yeah, how she so compares the t- his class to the dad I, I, I can't find the page right now, but like I, in that I scene, for it. right? Um, uh, Victoria sort of confesses to Howard the inside joke that she and her co-students have about the um, uh, academic ecosystem of Wellington. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. and they use the image of tomatoes. So for one professor, it's like, what is the being of the tomato? What is the essence of the right. tomato? You know, or, yeah. or what are the historical implications of the tomato? For us, it's um, like chairs, the bot. <laughs> like, yeah, 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 yeah. Or, yeah the, isn't it like just the like what's the, the chairness? Of the maybe that's the bit. <laughs> maybe that's the bit. Like maybe because traditionally it's chair, isn't it? But then, like maybe for them, the bit is like, what if we just fucking made it a tomato instead? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, to and make then one of our teachers. And uh, Victoria even says uh, that for her dad, the joke is tomato saves. Um, oh, yes. Right, right. Yes. What what she tells Howard is, uh, uh, you know what I like about you, uh, Howard, is that you can never just say that you like the tomato. Right. Yeah. Here. Okay, I found yeah, it yeah. already. Yeah. 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 Um, you, you, wait. Go ahead. Would you like to read it for us? <laughs> oh, the whole thing? And it, wait. It's, and she said yeah, because her, the way she says but it's like, but your class. Oh, should I do it in an English accent? Or no, no, <laughs> like, yeah. She basically says, your you class can. is a cult classic. I love your class. Your class is all about never ever saying, I like the tomato. 
That's why so few people take it. I mean, no offense. It's a compliment. They can't handle the rigor of never saying, I like the tomato, because that's the worst thing you could ever do in your class, right? Because the tomato is not there to be liked. That's what I love about your class. Okay, stop saying it. No. It's <laughs> properly intellectual. <laughs> there, it's properly intellectual. You You're go, right, Neil. You the tomato is just totally revealed as this phony construction that can't lead you to some higher truth. Nobody's pretending that the, the tomato will save your life, etc., etc. And that's what helps her say later that you know, yeah my dad says tomato saves and tomato mm. saves. and there's a there's a part later on where um where when she reiterates it there you are see you can never just say i like the tomato and like howard responds i thought we were talking about my wife not a vegetable <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah but um, right, no but like what it's interesting because um that's uh right after they they fuck um, they have mm-hmm. to like um, anxiously dress up and oh, go back right, into right. the yeah. Yeah. reception, uh, right? And then um, Victoria's like, "Yeah, yeah, no, you look fine. Just try to not to look like you like tomatoes." <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> "All right, <laughs> bitch." That, that like that was the mic drop part of the chapter. And then the chapter like ju- just skips to Helen Keller <laughs> was on a lecture tour <laughs> of New <laughs> England. Like, what the hell? <laughs> anyway, um, so the so that happens, but then that affair quite a bit like uh howard's affair with claire is quite brief and like he kind of his conscience sort of gets to him like i don't oh there there are two like uh significant incidents uh, between howard and victoria that happen after that which is that he ends up going to that sort of dinner formal dinner that she had invited him to before they began their affair um <laughs> which has this like hilarious scene where he erupts into laughter because there's a glee club yeah. <laughs> and, and it ends yeah, up it's like which an ends acapella up, group yeah which ends up like embarrassing <laughs> which ends up embarrassing victoria greatly but then she still tries to get it going with him and so she asks him to meet her at a hotel uh but he gets too freaked out by it so then he just like bolts and like she comes to him, and she ends up being the one to break up with him. Um, mm-hmm. And what ends up happening is after she breaks it off with Howard, she ends up dating Carl. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this sort of starts... who right now is is a hip hop archivist. Yeah, he's now a hip hop archivist. Yeah. Like he works at school. In 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 Levi's eyes, he's like totally uncool now. Uh, mm-hmm. he, and like. It's this arrangement that sort of launches them into the end game because uh, Zora and Jerome end up going to a party where Victoria and Carl are at. And once Zora finds and, out and, yeah. that Carl and Victoria are dating, she just like goes into a catatonic state shit. where she just like yeah. drags Carl out of the party and she like like expects like I did all these things for you and like he like rightfully points out the man that. Well, it's not like you were entitled. Yeah. (laughs) Like, yeah. Why do you feel entitled to, like, have a relationship with me just because you did all these things with me? It's not like I was asking for it. And, yeah. And, like, all these, like, angry feelings are coming out. And it gets to a point where, um, where Carl just basically lets out, you know, you think, like, you think your dad's such a good guy. Like, well, the truth is, like, he's actually been... You, why don't you ask him about Victoria? And he basically, like, lets it loose that Victoria and Howard also had an affair. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also, like, he also gets out the information about, like, Chantel and Monty. So, like, mm-hmm. now it's sitting sort of in Victoria and, Jer- and Jerome's head that, okay, we now have this information, this very explosive information that could, like, just overturn everything right yeah, now. Thoroughly yeah, thoroughly disillusioned. Yeah. Like they, yeah. 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 And, like, what happens at the same time is that Levi, uh, falling in with the Haitians, he steals the painting, as we said earlier, from Monty's office. (coughs) And, um... I didn't know that was a Chekhov's gun until they shot it, man. Yeah, no, yeah, Yeah, that was pretty wild. Absolutely, same. And, like, like, uh, this is my second time reading the book, but it's been so long since I last read it that all the twists were new. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, like, she, uh, like, he ends up hiding the painting under his bed so that when Kiki happens to be doing spring cleaning that morning, she and Jerome find the painting under the bed and naturally like she gets upset at him. Mm. Um but then they find the note uh saying like, Oh, oh it's right. from Carlene saying that Kiki you can have this painting. Yeah. And then on the other hand, upstairs, 
Zora is confronting her dad, saying like, "I know, I know about this shit. Like, fucking you asshole. <laughs> like, like <laughs> all the things she could say. Yeah, right. And he's just like begging for more time, more time, more yeah. time. And you know, she hurls exactly. an ancient English expletive. Yeah, at him. which I wonder, by the way, what was yeah. this? It, 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 I want to know. Dinkus. You yeah, dinkus. Is it dinkus? Is it dinkus? <laughs> Nicholas Cage, if you're listening, <laughs> get on the case. <laughs> I was gonna like, does that mean she and her dad? Like that made me wonder. Like, did they study like old English together, and then that's like their secret language, like as intellectual oh, father daughter that's a, shit? That's a nice nuance to insert in the middle of a yeah, fight scene. Yeah, exactly, right? Yeah. If we are like, I'm gonna say something that only you will truly understand. Yeah, so it hurts mm. extra. <laughs> so it hurts extra because I'm your only daughter. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, um, and and so like it's sort of implied that um, Zora and Kiki go off to tell each other about it, what they've each learned respectively. Mm-hmm. And then it cuts to the ending where uh, Howard is about to deliver a lecture on Rembrandt. Uh, Kiki has moved out. The kids are living with Howard. Um, Zora has basically like uh, m- caused both Monty and Howard, by virtue of their affairs, to end up sorting in, in positions where they can't like proceed with their their careers are essentially over without them having to retire. Um, and then Howard goes off to his lecture. And when he gets to the lecture, he realizes he left his lecture in the car. And yeah. so he kind of just like stands there awkwardly like, all right, then we're just going to look at these Rembrandt paintings. Yep. Rembrandt. Good old Rembrandt. <laughs> like literally just end. Here's yeah. the next slide. And yeah. A uh, painting from uh, 1632. Yeah, that, that's very um, poignant because, like, um, right, he gets to the lecture. It's all he has left. The book um, isn't, isn't it, even isn't finished. Isn't it also supposed to be the lecture that decides his tenure? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, everyone's yes. there. French is there. Even Kiki is there. And that's sort yeah, of the Kiki's important there. the important person who's there is Kiki, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, what's, what's interesting ends. also is, um, and I, I love the way Zadie Smith wrote this, because, like, in the beginning of the book... Um, uh, Howard, stuck in his old ways as an academic, as part of the old guard, is still using like the fucking OHP, right, or something. Yeah, yeah. and uh, absolutely. Um, and one of his colleagues is like, "You should use PowerPoint, like like PowerPoint yeah. will really help you with your lectures." And in the in Fuck this PowerPoint. lecture that he <laughs> that he's giving uh, at the end of the book, he's finally using PowerPoint, and but he's yeah. like inept at using the program. Yeah. Um, which is like, and it's so beautifully done because he he leaves his lecture notes in the car. He comes upon the painting that he's about to talk about. Hendricky, Hendricky, Hendrick, whatever. Hendricky. I'm not gonna try. Hendricky bathing, Hendrick. 1654. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, um, who was Rembrandt's lover? Mm-hmm. Uh, and he sees his old lover smiling in the in the audience. Yeah. And he looks I know. At the and the last shot, right, of this. And he looks at his love. And he looks at the painting, and he looks at his love, and because he's so inept at the program, he just keeps zooming in until it's the pixels of the brush. The street. hand solid shit. Yeah, and <laughs> and he has to just like ah, oh, this is on beauty. Anyway, so that's the whole fucking book. But okay, wait, I, I also want to point out here. I just realized now, like we've read. So, Maddie and I, we've read three Zadie Smith novels already. And this is, like, mm-hmm. I'm seeing, like, an inter- interesting patterns already between some of the books, that we, the books that we've read and the books that we are to read. Yes. But, like, in arguably, like, the, the, la- the these last three novels, like, White Teeth, Autograph Man, and On Beauty, they all end with somebody delivering some kind of speech and or presentation. That's very true. Where all the significant characters seem to be Are gathered in there, some form. Yeah. yeah, and you pointed this out also in um in White Teeth. Yeah. Na parang, it, it's, uh, that hard ending with everyone just there. Yeah. And and, yeah. It, and it's always meant and it's always sort of presented as a kind of emperor has no clothes moment where like yes. well the thing you uh-huh. believed in in the beginning turns out you were probably wrong. OHPs, we got powerpoints <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah, we got powerpoints now. Yeah. Your stubbornness to change has <laughs> been your hubris <laughs> all along, sir. <laughs> all along, sir. Yes. Yeah, so 
So it's an interesting pattern that I've noticed between yes, these two. I don't know. Absolutely. I haven't gotten to the end of NW yet, but it's going to be interesting to see if that if she, carries on. Yeah. There's yeah, another yeah, yeah. pattern I, I've seen between these novels so far, but I won't uh, give it until we reach swing until time. We? Grabe. Okay, fine. Because yeah, no, because there's <laughs> this is, there's an wow. inter- there's an interesting pattern that I will reveal um that I've seen like it's every other novel that she does something. Okay. Every anyway. other novel. Okay. Yeah, but that's on beauty. Uh, um And that's on what? Beauty. beauty. <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> that was so good. <laughs> and that's the beauty on, on that. beauty. All right. <laughs> so okay. So um, jam. You've listened yes. to our show. You know that we have a rating system that is required, recommended, or non-required. Um, do you feel like this is a book that would be required for everyone to read if you could let them read it? So a book that you would simply recommend, or a book that you feel is just you know not really required for people to read. It's interesting because this is, I have the unique privilege of reading this book uh, in two vastly different parts of my life. Right. When I first read oh, that's very On true. Beauty, I was in college. I was in the very establishment that Howard and Zora were navigating uh, mm-hmm. and participating in their um, power play endeavors. I was a wide eyed student who believed in the 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 light of academic elevated language and i was also a very active spoken word poet embarrassingly active in the scene um and uh while i can honestly say i changed my life for the better it changed my life for the better it's weird reading it now because now i'm like i'm 27 i'm freelancing i'm far from that place now i have a much more cynical attitude towards the university as an institution um in no small part due to the fact uh, of the uh, recent exposures that have transpired over the past year or right. the past few years, yeah. in which um, educators have been outed as sexual predators, exploiting the power imbalances between student and teachers, uh, students and teachers, um, and how fraught that is, to say the least. Um, it's weird. I don't know... Um, whether this, how exactly this book aged? Did it age well? Did it age badly? Mm, yeah. Um, right? Because um, many of the truisms, I guess, or isms um, that we find in the book are oddly prescient uh, in this time. The uh, Zadie Smith actually uses the phrase culture war in some part of the book between right. the liberal mm-hmm. sensibility and the conservative sensibility. And culture war is something that I find, that I've found is a term being appropriated by. Um, well, a lot of the right and a little bit of the left, um, yeah, discursively. Uh, now that I'm here uh, in this place, in this time with you all, well, uh, <laughs> with you all, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I, a part of me wishes that, I guess what I'm trying to say is, in my head, and I'm biased, in my head it's a required reading, but. Mm-hmm. When I was younger, I I don't think I read it the way I was supposed to, which isn't to say that um and I'd I'd maybe Zadie Smith would balk at the idea that there is a lesson to learn from all of this. I don't know how she would feel about such a claim. Yeah. Um, but I wish when I was younger, this book actually pushed me to interrogate the um, academic establishment more than I did before, if I even did at all. I only yeah. was able to do that after I graduated. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, do you guys feel that way? Like um. You're only I, able to look at where you came from with clear eyes because you've yeah. got far away from it. Yeah, Maybe absolutely. You. No, I was about to say that when you were the, describing this your relationship to this book in college, it made me think of what was my favorite book in college. Um, uh, it was called The Secret History, which Mio introduced to me. And I talked a little bit about it in one of our mm-hmm. Madeline Miller episodes because that book kind of helped me also find my place in the university because it also was kind of about the university. I yeah, guess you yeah. could say it was, it was about, about <laughs> it was about like a classics program. Yeah, exactly, and like a a, a, a liberal arts college, and um, and I wondered now if when I reread that as an adult, I'll feel the same way that I 
I did reading it in school and experiencing those things because um, I do agree with what you said. Like I, I in terms of um, seeing things, you know, retrospectively, I guess. Like mm-hmm. um, that's been like obviously there are so many things that I wish I didn't do in college and so many other things that I wish I did. But but um, I guess now. I, that also helps me to be not as cynical, I guess. Like, that, and that's not a you know like a slight against you or anything, Jam. But it, it's more like that's just me and how I'm perceiving things. And uh-huh. reading on beauty and seeing how Zora was doing things, like I feel like if I had gone to I think a different university, I would have been Zora. Like I would have, <laughs> I would have totally been more Zora. Mm, and yeah, yeah. and um. Mm. And I think I would, and if I had read this in college also, I think I would have totally related to her in that way. Um, yeah. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, this, so would you um, say it's uh, required or recommended or an unrequired for you, Maddie? Jam, would you, what was your answer? You said it. Required? That's a good question because, um, and I put this down in my notes, that On Beauty as a book, mm-hmm. in a way, interrogates the concept of the required reading. Yeah, nice. yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> Come right, right. On. I know this is like some Come shit on. that you would say in Howard Darcy's class, no, no. right? Yeah. <laughs> but like, it does interrogate the idea of a required reading. Absolutely. Like, do we, absolutely. Do we really need this again, John mm-hmm. Mulaney? Yeah. What is? Yeah. College. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, you get plus points for saying Emily Dickens is lesbian, <laughs> and um. I get you, yeah. So, but then would would you then not wanna? Are you just gonna be a, like super like no fuck it fuck the system? <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna yeah. say it's I'm required be a at all. <laughs> yeah, you, you'll be in the middle, and then me and me are gonna be like okay, and right, I'll say well, it's required. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, I don't know, I don't know, because like okay, I know we're, we're kind of dragging on, but like, can you imagine at all a professor talking about this book? Yes, <laughs> uh, I can. <laughs> I can actually yes, and Mio knows this, but like I think Mio, are you thinking of Dokmar? No, I mean or okay, wait. Are you thinking of well, and it okay, doesn't no, escape no, me okay. also that Zadie Smith is a professor. But so like, okay, you know. yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I'll I'll chime in here because I I feel like this book is required. I think it's a good, like okay. I personally I quite like like I have a bias towards novels that like help to contextualize the university experience in retrospect. Like you can tell. Mm-hmm. Whether somebody's writing a camp, like the campus novel is a genre. There are people who write it as, oh, okay, this is the present moment. They're not going to really reflect on their time. They're just going to live it. Um, whereas there are other campus novels where it's like, ah, yes, I remember years and years ago, I was but a babe. And they realized I was a foolish babe back then. Yes. Um, and, Indeed. And so, like, this, this feels like a novel that even though it's like set largely in the present, it is very much her looking back on her experience. And I realized, like, a lot of what's being discussed in this novel, like, summarize or, like, wraps up very neatly the conflicting feelings I have about the value of university. Mm-hmm. So, or the value, or pre- more precisely, of liberal arts education. Because the, that's sort of like a debate. That's a debate that's at the heart of the novel. Well, not really at the heart of the novel, but it's there in the novel. And it's sort of like, asking you without looking at the content like how will your experience as a human being be affected by like going to this system that uh you know is very prone to corruption Mm -hmm. in this kind of way um and i i can't i mean like i can't think of other novels that have tried to explore it in that regard say uh, say for example yeah like like secret history but that one's quite extreme because that involves yes. death uh, oh yeah <laughs> whereas this and one cults. whereas this one like like me saying like yeah i definitely felt a lot of my like i saw a lot of my own thoughts or thinking in yeah. in zora yeah is me sort of like saying like oh it's i feel like it's good that i read this now Rather than reading it in college, because I think if I had read it in college, um, I would have found myself resisting it rather than like hearing through everything that's going on. So it's good that I'm reading it in retrospect. 
And I think in that regard, like, it's something that, I mean, like, I can imagine, like, a, I mean, like, in it, it, to go back to your original question, like, imagining it in the context of a course, like, I can imagine it in terms of, like, modern British fiction. Like, here, sh- here she is, like, reinventing E.M. Forster for the contemporary age. Like, that's, like, something that fits squarely into a classroom context. But, like, outside of the classroom, like, I felt like, oh, it's a good thing that I read this now. I I wouldn't have enjoyed it then, but I'm glad to be reading it now or to have read it now. So, for me, in that sense, it's it's required. Mm. Mm. Okay. I think I would recommend it. Okay. I don't think I would necessarily require it. Um, I think it's... I did enjoy it more than I... Like, parang it was easier for me to enjoy this book than it was to get into the meat of White Teeth because that was so yeah hard <laughs> going in. And then, secondly, Autograph Man was so, like, eh for both of yeah, us. Yeah, this was and a weird, like, balance. We never really talked yes. about the style, but this was a weird balance between White Teeth and uh, Autograph Man. Yeah, like, this could have been in the middle of that if... But then all you know, like she wouldn't have gotten here if she didn't, you know, write autograph man first, and I, I, I get that. Um, but yeah, I think for me this is a this is a pretty recommended one. I think a lot of people, I know a lot of people would enjoy it. I think it would be interesting too if this was talked about, like if this was the entry point to novels that were like this, as opposed to White Teeth, because I think White Teeth is so is 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 very dense and um a little hard to kind of get people on if you're not on that vibe already mm-hmm. whereas That's i think fair. with this this is a this is a pretty good gateway like if you're teaching a class on like culture cultural lit i guess yeah this would be a pretty soft entry into that kind of course teaching yeah. so uh, i recommend it in that regard but i don't think it's that um it's that it's a hard re- i don't think it's a hard requirement for me that's fair that's fair you know what okay all right mandy i'll, I'll agree with you and recommend it instead of require it um, okay. And I say it for these reasons, right? Um, one thing, it's this stupid ass ache that some people have to contend with. Let's say a professor um, brings this book up in a class, and then you find out after all that all has been said and done that this professor is incorrigible and horrible. Yeah. Um, one thing that's going to happen um, is that even this, if this professor has not directly wronged you, you're going to have to contend with the fact that that well, so much of my intellectual foundation was shaped and formed by this educator. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, Definitely. now I know that this person is a fucking jackass. So does that mean that uh, uh, what I learned from this person is meaningless? Um, right. I don't know the answer to that question, but I cannot uh, stand the idea of like putting any student through that stupid ass ordeal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I will recommend it because um huh, perhaps okay, on beauty yeah, yeah. is an invitation for us to think about well okay well what are the required readings of my life gets back yeah, yeah, yeah right yes it, yeah it can it can guide us in that direction about what is truly necessary for us yeah. to understand what beauty yeah. is what a meaningful life and yeah. meaningful relationships are i think that's uh, sort yeah. of that's sort of the interesting difference that you introduced with your question jam because when you when you're when you're asking it in terms of like the classroom you're necessarily thinking or associating the book with the person who delivers the material whereas like like i, I mean like we're here doing this all on our own without the help of or without the guidance or moderation of any incorrigible figures so there is an aspect of it that is like yeah we're requiring it for ourselves or recommending right. it for ourselves like I, I i think that's an interesting i mean like like obviously like for us like this podcast with this sort of premise or conceit in mind um you know we're constantly trying to figure out like what's a better way to reflect our feelings towards the books that we're reading or the materials that we're discussing and this is like one form that that appreciation or valuation can take but it is definitely filtered through that lens of like associations like you know if you have been under like a professor who turned out to be a bad person yeah. like how does that affect your experience then of mm-hmm. the material 
Yeah. Now to that, I want to go back yet again to Elaine Scarry because she does make this bigger point that um, when you realize an error um, about your perception of beauty, the it's never the case that the beautiful <sighs> object has defaulted on a promise to you. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So like he all like she always like tries to remove the blame from. Mm-hmm. the beautiful object it could be that you have changed or something in your circumstances changed mm-hmm. that causes you to see your work differently but that doesn't mean that the essential beauty or quality of beauty of the object is reduced in any way yeah ah okay that's great okay yeah i would like to um point to this one paragraph near the end of the book so um uh th- it is at this point that howard and Kiki have been separated already. Um, he's the one taking care of the kids. His academic life is practically in shambles. And there's like this uh, calm. I suppose the calm that Maud Flanders had described. This is the calm yes. that followed after all the bullshit. Um, yeah. He steps out into the garden. And I'll read the paragraph. Um, Go ahead. Out, outside smelled of tree sap and swollen brown apples, of which maybe a hundred were scattered over the lawn. It had been like this every August for ten years. But only this year did Howard realize something might be done to improve the situation. Apple cobbler, apple crumble, candied apples, chocolate apples, fruit salads. Howard had surprised himself. There was nothing now that he didn't know about making food from apples. He had an apple dish for every day of the week. But it just didn't make as much difference as he'd hoped. Still, they kept falling. Worms spent their days passing through them. When they turned black and lost their shape, the ants came crawling. And maybe this is a naive point to make, but man... Make those fucking apple pies while you can, dude. While you still yeah. got fucking yeah. apples in your yard. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Was, no, that that makes sense. Because, like, he... This whole movie was him just wasting everything and not trying. I, this whole movie? Help me. <laughs> this whole book was him um, wasting so much time doing other things that yeah. were g- g- exceptionally meaningless. As opposed to trying to, yun nga, grasp everything, every moment of his life that could... Uh, be memorable and have importance and make the rest of his life like worth surviving yeah and and so to have that imagery of him like being like having like an endless supply of things to do then you know like with apples i guess that's like well uh that's like supposed to be like his lesson i guess yeah yeah like this was here pala yeah, if only exactly. I if myself, only I had noticed, yeah, yeah. yes, that I like yeah. apples. That I <laughs> <laughs> and not what tomatoes. I keep fucking, and not tomatoes. Yeah, I was about to say if I had just looked at like the other fruit in this garden, <laughs> maybe the real oh, fruit was in front of me all along. All along, maybe the real tomatoes were the apples we met along the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's on beauty. Um, that is. That's on, that is. All right. Uh, Jam, thank you so much for joining us for this episode. Thank you for being our very Thanks, first full time guest. Woo! Woo! Thank you, Woo! man. This uh, was really fun, y'all. Where can people find Thanks, you? Man. Where can people find your. Well, we said rest is noise, ph.com. That's where people can find some of your music writing. Where can people find you for more regular things? Okay, well, um, I have a tiny letter, which I haven't um, yes. posted stuff on in a while, but it's tinyletter.com slash slow down dilettante. That's a St. Vincent reference. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, love it. And uh, I have an Instagram where I blog about albums. I think of it, I, I tell people it's like a bookstagram, but for albums. Yes, it's, it is. <laughs> it's albstagram. And dot average dot law. So Instagram. Yeah. And that is a reference to... to... Hop along. Yes, it is. Hell sir. yeah! <laughs> oh my God, One was his love songs. average? Was it? Oh my God! Oh my God, Howard. Did he is obey so an average? average? He, <gasps> he so did. <gasps> <Whoa>. <gasps> I mean, let's be honest. Zara was the one who yeah, obeyed an yeah. average love. That's true. She did. She did. She did. <laughs> she was. Anyway. She was literally outside crying. No, but it's true. She Please. did. That whole but scene I is do. that. <laughs> <laughs> that whole scene was her yelling uh, that that whole bit. All right, of course That's I am for peace. Yeah. <laughs> yes. One day exactly. against me. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. All right, and uh, for everyone else, thank you for listening. Please uh, remember to give us a review or a rating if you feel that you like the show. We really appreciate. Give them five stars. Ah, oh, jam. Mm-hmm. 
Um, also, <laughs> give a listen to Jam's show. Jam, yeah. the gig He's is got a up. Fucking great podcast where you Woo! interview mm-hmm. people in the local music scene. Can you tell us a little more about your show and like what you've got up for this year? Oh yeah. Um, so I co-host the podcast with my friend Helena Barakel. Shout out to Helena. And um, we've got like a, a list of people that we'd like to interview this year. A uh, list which is covers like the next couple of weeks, but we'll get longer as the year uh, goes on. Um, we've got a lot of exciting stuff planned for you. We recently switched to Anchor from Buzzsprout because um, uh, 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 the rec room is using Anchor. So yes, we think, are. Hell yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, watch out for that. You can also find us on Spotify. Just look for The Gig Is Up PH. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Hells yeah. Great podcast name. Nice. Great podcast name. Thank mm-hmm. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Agree. I guess that's it for us. Are we gonna? And as always. <laughs> it ain't like that. <laughs> <laughs> and as always. I don't know where to go. My, my life, life to you seems, seems wrong. wrong. Here's oh, no! me trying, trying to, to do, do these songs. When you Thanks for listening to The Rec Room. This episode was edited by me. Our artwork is by Mandy. Our theme song is 64 Sundays by Twin Musicom, which is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution License. Check out more of their music at www.twinmusicom.org. For more updates on The Rec Room, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at The Rec Room Pod. Rec spelled R E Q. In this rec room? Do we have a guest on this episode? Whoa! <laughs> Man. The intro. <laughs> 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 And this is a rec room. We have a podcast about the rec room. <laughs> 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 Leave that all in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right.